instruction. If we did not believe in instruction, we would not have a Bible college so on and so forth. But more than instruction, we believe in impartation. We believe there's a whole lot of stuff can be caught that can't be taught. And that if you get around the anointing enough, a little bit of it rub off on you. I found out victory is contagious. 
Just look at somebody, look them right in the eye and say, don't stand too close to me. I'm anointed. I'm anointed. Yoke destroying, burden removing, anointing. Now look right back at them and shout, yes you are. Yes you are. We've had too many seminars, workshops, counseling sessions. <laughs> and I right, Brother Terry. That's exactly right. My God, you're a preaching man. I'm so glad you're here. You're going to be here all week. All week long, one of the greatest preachers that ever took a pulpit, Dr. E.L. Terry, is in the house. I'm so glad to have you here. How wonderful to see you. But I know that you're a man that believes in impartation. It doesn't mean it, it matter if it's a cloth, a hand, some dead dry bones laying in a cave. You get around the anointing, you to get on you. You can't help it. We, we, we didn't come here this week to play. We didn't come in here this week to act and do our little religious thing. We came in here hungry, thirsty, searching, Looking, hoping, believing, trusting, leaning. Shout yeah! And we, 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 we not going to get started to some little religious thing. See that man in Acts 3, he never had been to the praise and worship seminar. Had nobody taught him the charismatic two-step. He didn't watch no videotape, running in slow motion to try to get that dance. Help me somebody. Peter looked at him and said, silver and gold have I none but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of now. Rise up and walk. And in a split second, the man went running and leaping and praising God. Somebody shout, jump up, jump up, jump up. Come on, you've been crippled long enough. Jump up, you've been lame long enough. Jump up, jump, 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 jump. I thought I heard a shout in here. Van Halen gonna have to take a back seat now. Woo! Now if you feel like running the aisle, just help yourself. 
glad to have you. It's going to be a wonderful week. Just stay all week. You got a, you got a seat now. I'd hold on to it if I had you. Praise the Lord. We're thankful for all these over 100,000 prayer claws that have been sent in during the last two weeks. Can't get to Dominion Camp Meeting, but believing for the anointing to saturate those claws and bring deliverance. How many of you believe? Amen. Pastor Ralph Gerard down in Florida wrote to me this week and he's talking about the other night when I preached on TBN on the subject of hope. He said, you gave America hope the other night. Said his church is alive with the spirit of jubilee. He said, my God, it's like lighting a match in a gas-filled room down here. Everything is up, up, up. These pastors, Harold, where's Harold? Harold, brother, since that Friday night, a pastor's conference, when the Holy Ghost so mightily used you, and it was the greatest service I've ever been in in my life, just before or since. We've had some barn burners around here since. So. But, but you remember, I said, God is raining down buildings. Just rain. Remember the Baptist man baptized in the Holy Ghost. For those of you, I come out here every Sunday morning of the world, every Sunday morning of the world, and tell how it's happening all over America, around the world, happening in the Bahamas. Pastor Mario Moxie over here. USA Today over there interviewing him because when a boat carrying 350 homosexuals wanted to dock in their port, he took his church out there and stood in the dock, preached the gospel and said, we ain't opening the door to you. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. Why well, right here in Columbus, Ohio, got up this morning, turned on the local news, and they're telling everybody how to get to the homosexual parade downtown today. They say a word about Dominion. Won't be 2,000 people down there today, and they'll wreck havoc everywhere they go. This week, we will bring in $30 million into the economy of this city and they can't even say, by the way, Dominion Camp Meeting is going on. But we don't care. See, I don't need their platform. I got my own. Yes, I do. He said, uh, this Pastor Gerard, he was here on that Friday night. He said, uh, we're looking for a building. He's moved out of two since September, looking for a third one to move into. So we can't handle the adults. He said the teenagers in our church are packing out our, our current sanctuary four nights a week. Pack it out, can't even get in. Yes, Jesus. He said, we are hooked up. Said last Sunday morning, a hard shell Baptist. Now, he, he thinks that the guy just meant that that was just a colloqu colloquialism. <laughs> I didn't say Holy Ghost. <laughs> anyway, but there, there is, hard shell is a, is a denomination in, in the over 600 different Baptist denominations. I know because I am one. Baptist. Baptist. Listen. He said a hard shell Baptist saw our ad in the yellow pages, came Sunday morning, came back Sunday night. God healed him on Sunday night. He came back the next Sunday morning, came to the altar, baptized in the Holy Ghost, said he'd been drunk for a week. It's Jubilee. Yeah.
Every Sunday morning, I get to tell stuff like this. Here's, this is all that came, just a, just a FedEx, an overnight. This is all that came. Said, uh, this, is a, this is an associate pastor in St. Louis, Missouri. Associate pastor. The pastor was murdered in a carjacking in St. Louis, Missouri. So the associate took over the church. So you can't stop us. You can't stop us. Said he'd been uh, holding the tithe where they sold their building to get a larger building after, after seeing the Friday night of pastor's conference. So when they sold their building, he said, I heard one of your taped sermons on the subject of tithing. Well, I have several. <laughs> the last bastion of satanic resistance on this earth is your money. The last, the last strangled hope the enemy exercises against the church is your money. Once we get your money, Jesus is coming. Don't shout me down. Said, I heard a taped sermon on tithing. I've been holding the tithe of the sale of that property for over a year, and the Holy Ghost would not let me go. So here's the tithe, and here's his check for $50,000. Somebody ought to thank the Lord. If it's your 50,000, you be shouting. Here's another pastor, New Beginning Ministry, Grand Ridge, Florida. My wife and I are excited about being a part of this year's camp meeting. They've got a daughter here in uh, World Harvest Bible College. Said, we're believing, we're building a new building. Now you, you may, see I didn't make this up. This, this, this happens every Sunday. Sometimes it takes me an hour just to read them. They come from everywhere. Everywhere, every week, every week, every week, every week. Why? Folk getting hooked up. Folk get something's happening. Something's happening all across the land. We're turning from our old ways, seeking God again. Serve notice on you, devil. I'm in this thing to win. And here's another pastor. I believed all my life that God would help us help pastors. Here's another pastor. Said they had their annual business meeting. Monday night of this week and voted to send a seed offering. This is a small church, maybe a hundred members. Said, said they sent a seed offering and here's their check, $2,500, believe it. Is this pastor here? I know they're coming. I know they're coming. Are they here yet? Come here. Come here, let me get my hands on you. Come on. Yeah. Somebody shout a little bit. Somebody shout a little bit. Shout it came to get it and he's going to have it. Shindo play, let go down. I dare you to stay the same. I dare you to stay the same. Yeah, boss, somebody say, "Go on, say, bang, say, bang, on, some man." Yeah, yeah, some down on the back of the ear. Oh, shout! I'm gonna get mine. Ah, you can't keep me out. You can't hold me down. You can't push me back. You can't tell me what is not. I already know what he is. Be seated. Be seated. Don't hurry him now. Don't hurry him. We can walk over top of him. Get him up, 
get him up, get him up, get him up, get him up. Stand right here. Stand right here. What you got there? It's your banner? Oh. This has been laying on an altar in your church? You said, God, I don't know how to do this. And you're just exactly the kind of person I can use. I don't need people that got a head filled with knowledge. I need people that have a heart filled with obedience. Your seed is in my hand, and I'm going to put your harvest in your hand. You may be seated. Hallelujah. The pew in front of you is the key to unlock your future. It's a little envelope. We're ready to receive your tithes and your offerings, believing you to mix your praying and giving together. That's the secret that these pastors and churches all over America are finding out. We've had testimonies since September. Of men that sold ten thousand dollars it came back they sold twenty five thousand dollars it came back they sold fifty thousand dollars it comes back and every time it comes back doubled every time i've had them on the platform haven't i had them right here on the platform we believe in sowing seed if you're making a check this morning make it payable to world harvest church or put a whc on your check folks always ask me i never pay any attention to it Folks ask me, what's the budget of the ministry for the year? I said, whatever we need to preach the gospel, and do everything God told us to do. But, uh, you know, there are other folks that pay more attention to that kind of thing. The budget for this week, for this local church, we've, we have now spent $497,000 on this week, just on this week. Half a million dollars we lay out for this week to bless you. Now, we've already been having Jubilee, so... We just brought you in to share it with you. And if you're going to get involved in it, you're going to have to sow into it to unlock God's blessing into your life. If you're making out a check, World Harvest Church or WHC is all you need. If you have an offering envelope for your cash giving in the pew in front of you, fill that out completely. Drop it in the offering container when it comes by. Father, in the name of your Christ, we thank you for the opportunity to participate in your kingdom. 
Thank you that everything in this kingdom we've been given the revelation works in direct opposition to everything in the kingdom we came out of. If we want to be lifted up, we must bow down. If we want to live, we must die. If we want to receive, we must give. And so I thank you for the revelation of your kingdom that brings us to a place of faithfulness over your word as you are faithful over it to perform it on our behalf. Thank you for this offering this morning. Break every record of a Sunday morning offering in Jesus' name and we'll give you the glory. Amen and amen. Is everybody ready? Look at the person next to you and say, is that the best you can do? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now we have little rules around here. How many of you believe rules are okay? If you should feel like shouting, it's okay. If you should feel like dancing, hello, Mark. I didn't even see you. Hello, Dina. Thought you were going to come stay all night with me last night. Got in too late. You coming today? My little girl's waiting on you. Hallelujah. 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 I'm telling you about the rules. That's what I'm doing. And one of the rules is you can do anything you want to do after the offering container passes by you. <laughs> but if you go to jumping up before you put anything in, God will get you. And mess you up. <laughs> Hallelujah. You ready to give? Shout them ready. Yeah. Hallelujah.
this precious lady. I wanted her to sing this morning. Three weeks ago, she lay paralyzed on the entire right side, wasn't it? On the entire right side of her body, eye closed, mouth dropped, hand and arm dead, dead. Said she'd never recover, massive stroke, but the church went to pray. She knows what she's saying. gonna get there somebody gonna get there we uh we just three weeks ago I told this bunch, I said, I, I want to get, get some of this on CD. And I told these folks, three days after I told them, we came in here live on Sunday morning, and we didn't take nothing out. We had Jubilee. And on this CD, I, I preached maybe 15 minutes. That's a miracle if you want to hear it. I came to magnify, jump and shout, new wine, celebration. Are you ready for a miracle? The jubilee anointing, healing in this house, sweet aroma of worship. Let your anointing fall on me, spirit of the sovereign Lord. Raise the standard, hold on to what you got. The devil is defeated. Shout hallelujah and jubilee. And uh, there somewhere back yonder, I, I think it's audio tape, CD and video. You get the whole thing. But somebody else that finally did what I wanted him to do, and that is do just that. Walk into a sanctuary full of the anointing of God and worship God. I don't know anybody more anointed to worship the Lord than Gary Oliver. He's just, just this week released a brand new CD of worship before the Lord. It's incredible. Make sure you get it. And would you welcome part of our family, Gary Oliver.
Come on, somebody put your hands together for Jesus in this house now. Come on, come on, come on. Don't patty cake for him, but clap your hands for him. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the great I am. Hallelujah. Come on, you can bless him this morning. Come on, you can bless him this morning. Lift up your hands and open up your mouth and give him a praise in this place. Come on, that's it. Open up your mouth and let the fruit of your lips be as the evening sacrifice. Somebody worship him. Somebody worship him. I don't know of a better way to walk in to the beginning of Dominion Camp Meeting than just to say, Welcome into this place. Say, Welcome into this broken vessel you desire to abide in the praises of your people so we lift our hands and we lift our hearts as we offer, as we offer up this praise unto, unto your name. come on and lift your hands again and say
You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. That's Gary Oliver. Let me point out just a couple of things very briefly to you, and the man of God is coming. As I shared with you a little earlier, this week, the conservative estimates are that we will bring $30 million into the economy of this city. I hope that with that, we will leave every restaurant, every hotel, smiling, just hoping folk like you will come back. I, I am a pastor, and so I just have to say things like this. If your meal is $10, and you don't have $1.50 or $2 more, then you don't have money to eat. 15% minimum well but but they didn't treat me right all the more reason bless these people if you can't go in a restaurant and leave a tip go to McDonald's where it's not expected treat the hotel staff with courtesy and honor they're working folk. They work hard for the money. Please treat them kindly. And should you run into part of my 387 member staff or the over 2,000 volunteers who are working this week to put this camp meeting on for you, please give them a smile. My wife and I for the last two days have said we love camp meeting, but God bless our staff. They work so very, very hard. And just bless them a little bit every now and then and let that nursery worker know you appreciate it and that children's worker out there at 90 degrees with your babies know you appreciate it. Would you do that? And we would be so thankful. You may be seated. Don't forget these 100,000 or more prayer claws. Extend your faith toward them. Tonight, 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 I'm going to take this pulpit and we're going to have a party tonight at 7 o'clock. These folks will all be here. Gary Oliver will be here. And just before I preach, we're going to turn God's property loose in the house. We're going to have a time tonight. So don't miss that. Friday of this week at 10 a.m. is the Breakthrough Partner Anointing Service. Last year, I personally laid hands on over 6,000 people in that service. I'm going to paint you this year. I'm going to paint you with a fragrance that attracts the favor of the Lord in the Breakthrough Partner Anointing Service. I'm going to put my hands on you. And uh, in order to be a part of that anointing service, you must be a Breakthrough Partner. If you are not a partner, you can sign up at the Breakthrough Partner table in the front foyer by the bookstore. Pastors and full-time ministers interested in being part of one of the fastest growing ministerial fellowships in the world, World Harvest Church Ministerial Fellowship, where you can receive fellowship and or ordination. If you're interested in that at all, make sure you pick up information that's in the north foyer. Camp meeting videos and audios are available. Be sure to visit all the product tables and uh, the concessions over here. They've got everything in the world. I went in there, they were cooking a pot of greens. Greens, I said. She dug down in, I said, you don't know nothing about greens. She dug down in there and pulled out a big old ham hock. I said, you know green. There's some good stuff over there. That's right this direction in the cafeteria. Make yourself available to that. Pastor's Conference, September 23rd through the 25th. Those are the dates. 
don't miss your opportunity. We believed for 1,500 to register. Last year had 7,500 register. So make sure that you write down those dates to be a part of pastor's conference. Several years ago, I found myself preaching a crusade in the Bahamas. I was up late at night and caught a rebroadcast of, a early, of an earlier Trinity Broadcasting Network Praise the Lord program. And Mario Morello was preaching. That was at about one o'clock in the morning. I watched the sun come up at seven o'clock. As the Spirit of the Lord so filled that hotel room, touched my life, I wept, crawled across the floor, begged God to keep an anointing on my life that I could do for others what Mario Murillo did for me. And I am delighted for him to be with us for the first time, not here at the church, but the first time at Dominion Camp Meeting, one of America's great preachers. Would you welcome Mario Murillo? Everybody, please stand up for a moment. Thank you. Please remain standing, everybody. How many of you believe that uh, accepting an offer to preach for Rod Parsley, you feel like you're challenging Betty Crocker to a bake-off, you know? <laughs> and then to have Gary Oliver here, this is incredible. This is an incredible day. Now, everybody, please look at me. I know you know how to worship God. I've never seen a group that can worship God like this group. We have people from all over America, people from all over the world. This is an occasion that is marked by the divine strategy of God. I know that you may be from Africa, you may be from India, you may be from South America, you may be from the Soviet bloc, you may be from any one of a number of nations today but we are in America and America needs a massive intervention of God right now like we have never needed it before I maybe agree with that what we need what we need goes beyond words now you know and I know come on now let's not mess around you know and I know that God did not give us the Holy Ghost for ourselves. God did not give us these gifts for ourselves. We are not here to be the best party on the deck of the Titanic. The nation and our president need to be convicted of the Holy Spirit and the power of God. Do you believe that? I mean, if you believe that, raise your hand. How do you pray? When I, when I started praying, how do you pray to preach in a situation like this? God said, talk like you're talking to America. I said, Lord, what do you mean? He said, I've given this church a voice to America through their representatives, through their workers, through their prayers, and through television. This is not a church for Columbus, Ohio. How many of you understand what I'm saying? Thank God for what you're doing for Columbus, Ohio. But you are not just for Columbus, Ohio. You are for the United States of America too. All of the name. How many of you believe the White House ought to feel the power of God right now? How many of you believe that every city ought to feel the power of God right now? Lord Jesus, what do I say? What do I say to this audience? I had to be sure. Because this week, every night, you're going to have the best of the best of the best. You're going to have voices talk to you. Every one of them is going to open their heart and tell you. And I'm the lead-off hitter. I'm, i got to get on base. How many of you know that? I've got to get on. 
But I want you to join hands with a neighbor right now. Have a word of prayer with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, if ever you hurt me, this is the time that I need you to hear me. And I ask you, oh God, that my words will not be human opinion. They'll not in any way, shape, or form cater to a camp. But they will be the word of God for this moment in this situation. Let the people of God receive with ears that are not human ears, but the spiritual ability to grasp and change. And most of all, oh God, let us not listen and agree, but listen and be ignited to never be the same. And I thank you for it. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Somebody have said amen. Give the Lord praise right now. Glory. Well, you may be seated. Everybody, please get your Bible out if you will. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. I want you to look at chapter 10 of the book of Isaiah. Everyone, please. Ladies and gentlemen, as you're turning to Isaiah 27, I want you to know how this message that you're about to hear, which is entitled The Yoke and the Anointing, and I want everyone to say it out loud. The Yoke and the Anointing. I'll say it with you again. The Yoke and the Anointing. These are two words that we use all the time. And I want to tell you how this message that you're about to hear began. How many of you have ever been frustrated? Raise your hand. How many of you today are hungry for more of God? Raise your hand. Everybody's talking about changing America. We are a movement that believes in great power, great anointing, great miracle power. But the fact of the matter is, the devil has trapped most of our movement in the barracks. We're not out doing it. We're not having an effect on America. And I'm going to stop and tell you that it is important for us to understand that much of our movement has lost the ear of this nation. They're not listening to us. We are not having the audience that we need to have. So, and I want to tell you, I got frustrated with that. And I'm going to start tonight, by, this morning, by telling you exactly where my frustration came. It came one day when I was looking on TV and I saw a friend of mine preaching. He has a large ministry, and he looked tired. I may have ever been tired, raise your hand. This man looked exhausted. The eyes were red. He could barely hold his Bible, and he looked in the camera, and listen to me. And don't get this wrong, because you got to hear the whole thing. He looked in the camera, and he said, I want you to send me money to pay for the airtime that allows me to stand here and ask you for money to pay for the airtime that will finance my ability to stand here and ask you for money. Now, we need your money this week desperately so that we will be able to pay for the airtime that allows me to stand here and ask you for money. That is what is known, everybody get ready for a loud amen, as a vicious cycle. Many, many, many churches in this nation don't want to admit it, but they are in a vicious cycle. And the vicious cycle is that they have been rendered ineffective by the demands of their administrative and philosophical muscle-bound organization. In other words, there's a lot to them, but none of it gets to where it belongs. Now, it is amazing how many preachers will condemn liberals for throwing money at a problem. But we are trapped. And I was trapped. I said, Lord, the world, we cannot, listen to this, listen to this phrase, see if it makes sense. We cannot afford to preach the gospel to the lost. 
because we've got to underwrite our operation. And by the time we've spent it on ourselves, there's nothing left emotionally, physically. And I didn't want it to be that way. I mean, you know, I do not want to finish my race not having preached to the lost. And you know what? We can't get them in most churches. That's what makes you such a miracle. You are a miracle. You are a grand exception to the rule. In most parts of America, people no longer are able to be influenced to go to spirit-filled meetings. And the tragedy of it is, is for all the wrong reasons, I got frustrated. And the Lord, I said, what do I do? The Lord said to me, look at me, everyone. Stop what you're doing. And I said, Lord, I'll slow down. The Lord said, I didn't tell you to slow down. I told you to stop. Amen. And do what? Go on a mountain for 30 days and seek my face for a month and be willing to stop and change everything about you and your ministry. And then if you want to, I will give you the key to having 40% of your audience be people that never go to church, that do not know God, that have nothing to do with Christianity and I'll give them to you rather than fatten up the saints I'll give you an audience with those that don't know God now I'm gonna say something listen to me I'm glad for Christian television I'm glad for it I was on it just last the other night I was on nationwide but I don't want to be the best on Christian television I want to preach the gospel on Oprah Winfrey come on somebody help me I want to get the word where it'll be heard. This isn't for you. It's not for me. It's for them. And it struck me. I said, oh God, they're not in my meetings. They're not listening. And I want to have an effect. The Lord said, if you're ready, I'll do it. But you got to stop. Now see, I told the Lord I'd slow down. And one day this man in a car rolled right through a stop sign and a police officer saw him, pulled him over, said, you didn't stop. He said, but officer, I slowed way down. <laughs> the officer was not a good officer. He got mad, put out his nightstick, began to beat the man on the head. Pow, pow, pow. He said, you want me to slow down or stop? Lord said, Mario, stop. Now that's easy. Call some committees where they got a big crusade set up and tell them you ain't coming. We've advertised this. We got rent on the auditorium. We got everything set up and you're not coming. I'm not coming because I need to have, listen to me, I have to have an immediate loss to enjoy a long-term gain. I have to have an immediate loss to have a long-term gain. And I've got to ask God, I'm not here to be a popular, charismatic preacher. I want to reach the gang member, the satanic worshiper, the gay movement, the liberal, the lost, the hurting, the outsider. I want to reach them. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong. I don't want to bless you. I want to deliver them. 30 days. It's a long time. You got to change this. You got to clean that. You got to call this man. You got to get that right. You got to get on your face. I spent hour after hour, day in and day out on that mountain, and then the Lord shocked me. He said, I want you to understand, son, that crusades as you've known them no longer work. They cost money. They demand a lot of time and a lot of effort, but after it's over, one, two percent of the people that come forward are in the church a year later. It's not going to make a difference. Now, you can keep going that way if you want and look right, but if you want to be popular, that's your thing. But do you want to be effective? Because you're on the mountain of effectiveness. You know what? Let me ask you something. How many of you know we got to be brave enough as leaders? I'm talking to every pastor and leader in this room and every Bible college student. You're going to have to make a decision if you look right to your contemporaries or you are being guided by a divine strategy. You know what? I do not want my contemporaries to say I was right. I want history to say that man messed me, messed up the evil of his generation. 
Now let me tell you some. One day I was reading the Los Angeles Times. Many of you have not heard of a woman of God that lived a couple of decades ago. She died about 50 years ago. Excuse me, 50 years ago she died. She's one of the greatest women of God that ever lived. Her name is Amy Semple McPherson. She was drawing 15, 20,000 people all by herself every weekend in Los Angeles. Movie stars from everywhere went to hear her preach. Fifty years she's been dead, and every year to this day, the Los Angeles Times writes a deflammatory article against her. I got so jealous. Somebody get loud with me right here. I got so jealous. I said, what was it about that woman that made the devil so mad that 50 years after she's with Jesus, he's still complaining about it. He's still complaining about it. Somebody get excited, please. The Lord gave me an acronym for crusades. Costly. Repetitious. Unproductive. Systematic. Approaches. Duplicated. Everywhere. I said, thank you. Costly, repetitious, unproductive, systematic approaches duplicated everywhere. Because you don't discern the city's need. You don't see the specific hurt of that community. You don't know how to get the army mobilized. You don't know how to wake up the saints and show them the things that will make them change a city. And then a year later, there are no results left. So it's a costly, repetitious, unproductive, systematic approach duplicated everywhere. So the Lord, I said, Lord, you've never told a man what was wrong with something unless you were going to tell him how to fix it, how to do it right. Now, I've been here a month now, and I want to know what to do now. He said, don't have a crusade. Have an impact. And I said, well, what's an impact? He gave me another acronym, Invasion Ministries. Producing actual community transformation. I want this conference to be the one camp meeting in all of America this summer that says, y'all want to laugh, fall down, talk in tongues, have at it. But as for us, we're going to get a word from God to change America, to change America. Come on, somebody. Change America. Let me hear you shout this. I want you to say amen, amen. to say amen, amen, and to this fact that gauge our success this way. We're not going to look at how many we got in the building, but how many are still left outside. How many people are still left on drugs, still left in prostitution, still left hurting, and we're going to go get them in the name of Jesus. So somebody give God the glory. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. Do not think that just because I'm reading the verse now, I've just started. I am well into this. It shall come to pass in that day. We are all talking about the year of Jubilee. And I think that it is interesting that everybody that talks about it has a different definition of what that means to America. Man came up to me and he said, well, America's got a good economy. I said, no, sir, we do not have a good economy. We have a strong economy. Because in a good economy, the f poor would be fed and clothed. In a good economy, the races are equal. In a good economy, men and women make the same salaries. Come on, somebody help me, please. We have a strong economy, but it is not yet a good economy. 
So when you say to someone, what would the year of Jubilee mean to America? Well, I would like to think that first it would mean the restoration of morality to our leadership. Because if the men and women we vote for do not believe adultery is wrong, do not believe homosexuality is a sin, then how can they expect the youth of this nation to have any values at all? Are you with me on that? I would like to think of a year of Jubilee as a time of God working, but listen to me. Everybody shouts, talks, yells about how America needs to be changed. And then we'll talk about how certain camps believe that their gift will change America. Maybe we could laugh the sin away. Maybe we all fell down and one group said maybe all we did was intercession. If that's all we did, if all we did was laugh, if all we did was fall down. And I've got to tell you, I love you and I love the move of God in America. And don't get me wrong, I'm not against spirit-filled believers. But there are times that I didn't want to tell somebody I was charismatic because of all the foolishness within our ranks. And the foolishness within our ranks, a lot of time when men and women in our movement act like fools and the media exposes them, they say, well, the media is not of God. How many of you know, sometimes the media is right. Sometimes we've done stupid things. I went to a meeting and they told me that in our meeting they said, the women bark like dogs and moo like cows. So I told the women as soon as I got the pulpit, I said, if you want a husband, there are two things you don't do in church. Somebody help me with that. Come on, honey, don't bark like a dog. And do not moo like a cow. People said, I can't go and change America. I'm getting over my past curses. I'm recovering, I'm, I'm getting over this thing. I'm a victim and God's helping me to have inner healing. And then I read it said, it shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder. Everybody look at me, say this out loud. My goal, My goal is, to is to relieve the burden, the burden of, those of those who are lost. That's my goal. Now, see, I'm going to tell you something. You may not believe it, but you're blessed enough already. You're fed enough already. How many of you know, if anything, we got too many teachers in America. We got too many seminars in America. We got too much. We've already got enough doctrine for 18 revivals. What we need is for God to set on fire what we already know. I'm going to try this half over here. They look anointed. God needs to set on fire what we already know. We already know more than enough. We've already heard it in the Greek and the Hebrew and conjugated five ways. We know that we know what we know and we're already trained, already equipped, already ready. But it says this, in that day, the burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. Now, I want to ask you a question. If we go by modern publicity, a good conference is when you have a big crowd. People give. A lot happens. Mailing lists get enlarged. And all of that's important. But history will not remember any of those things. It'll, it'll say what? So? So what? And every man and woman of God that preaches harbors an inner conviction that they won't tell anybody else about because they're afraid to. And that is this. What is the real achievement of my life going to be? What is going to be the memory of me? How will people, upon reflecting on me as a leader and a man of God, what will they say? And I said, Lord, at the end of that mountain, I will have these events. I will change however I need to change. And the Lord said, son, you need the anointing. You need the anointing. 
But don't go by what everybody tells you is the anointing. Don't go by what everybody teaches you is the anointing. The anointing is not a groovy feeling. Give me an amen. It's not a hot flash or a cold chill. It's not loudness even. It's not even the ability to shout, even though I'm shouting now. And why? Because if I don't shout, I'll blow up. So the Lord said, Son, there are two words. You've got to do this. You've got to know the word yoke. Everybody say yoke. yoke. Everybody say anointing. anointing. Now here's the number one sin of all American preachers. This is what we do wrong. We do not define our words. There's too much running around saying things. You know the anointing of brave the yoke. You don't know diddly what you just said. <laughs> And, and people even get excited. They figure if I, if I don't look it up or pray about it, I can cover it up by yelling. Anointing! Doesn't mean a thing. Somebody get ready to give me an amen. I don't want an anointing that makes me popular. I want an anointing that makes demons flee in the name of Jesus. I want an anointing that makes lives change in the name of Jesus. I want an anointing that the devil says, I'm out of here. Are you with me? But let me tell you what. First things first. I believe that every generation since the beginning of time has had two poles and the polarity and the tension between these two poles is universal. Every generation, look at me now. Every generation has a yoke and an anointing. And everything besides those two issues does not matter. It's time to cancel the board meeting, fire the consultant, get rid of the spin doctor, and get down to the basics of the word yoke. So I looked it up. And the Lord said, I want you to do two things with the word yoke. Number one, define it. In the natural and then define it in the spirit so that nobody is ever confused all this week you're going to hear great teachers and preachers talking I believe that the foundation that the Holy Spirit wants me to lay as one of the first voices is to say can we be delivered from the charismatic culture that would make us have just one more conference and can we be invaded by God? Wouldn't it be great to have an outpouring of the Holy Spirit this week that out of this one building, every single city in this nation is impacted by God. Now, to do it, let me get to the word yoke. A yoke is an instrument of forced labor. You cannot yoke an animal until you have broken its will, destroyed its dream, told that animal, you're never going to the river when you want. You're not going to see your children when you want. You're not going to live in the jungle. You're not going to live in the savannah. You're not going to live out in the field. You're going to live in a pen, and I will tell you when you will come and when you will go. Give me an amen on that. Here is what a yoke must do. First, it must destroy hope. Second, it must kill dreams. You must overcome the animal to yoke it. Then the yoke is placed upon the neck of an animal whose will is broken, whose dream is dead, whose future has been arrested and removed. And then it is told you will labor for someone else's benefit. The Old Testament writers, God said, look at what they meant. They meant this, that at every juncture of human history, Satan has created a yoke. And that yoke was clearly understood by the prophets of their day. They knew what it was. They knew what the yoke of their day was. God said to Moses, let me talk to you about what the yoke is. The yoke is Pharaoh. The yoke is Pharaoh.
and Pharaoh has broken the will of the Jews, the descendants of Israel. He has destroyed their dreams. They are in forced labor and they cannot be liberated. And I'm sending you. Look at me, please. When God visited Gideon, it must have been the most hilarious moment in human history. Let me tell you very quickly. Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine vat. Now, you don't do that because you need a breeze to blow away the chaff. But he's afraid. He's scared. So he's threshing wheat in a wine vat. Meanwhile, up in heaven, God says, look, the Midianites are the yoke, and I'm sending you to a man who will be a great deliverer. He's a mighty man of God. So the angel flies down there looking for Arnold Schwarzenegger. He lands on the wine vat, and he says, the Lord is with you. And he looks in the wine vat. And it's not Arnold, it's Pee Wee Herman. Help me somebody. And he looked at him and he's trying to read the line that God gave. The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon knew the yoke was a Midianite. Let me tell you about the most important yoke that I can think of. Goliath. Because it was a yoke by default. Here's what he said. He said, send out a deliverer. I'll fight him. If he wins, then we'll put on your yoke. But if I win, you wear our yoke. And because they didn't send anyone out, already the yoke of bondage had won by default. They were frozen in fear by their indecision. That is the spirit-filled movement in America right now. Now, we have talked about we're going up to the high place and going to tear the devil's kingdom down. We haven't left the parking lot. Come on, somebody help me. We said, Satan, we're going to get you. Satan, we're going to bring you down. I take authority. He's under my feet. He's under my feet. No, he's not. Carpets under your feet. And the fact of the matter is, as you look at it, I'm, somebody say amen, please. Amen. That as we look at it, here is the fact. Because Goliath said, send somebody out, and nobody went out already. We've lost by default. We cannot look at America without knowing America's two greatest enemies. The first is the sinner without God who looks happy. Because they're a living lie. I've got it made. I've got everything I need. And they're a living lie because they're saying, I've got no God, but I'm satisfied. That's the number one enemy of America. The number two enemy of America is a born-again believer who looks miserable. Come on, somebody, help me with that. A born-again believer who is saved. I'm not happy. I'm not satisfied. I'm not on fire. Because both are a lie. Now I'm going to say something else and I want you to get with me on this. We can cry about all the things that gays have stolen. We can cry about all the things that Congress stole. All the things that the media stole. All the sin that the criminals have stolen. But what about what the army of God has given away in this country? What have we given away? Goliath said, send somebody out. The devil is saying in America, send somebody out. How many of you know we're going out? I'm going to try to, I said we're going out. The yoke was Pharaoh. Ladies and gentlemen, look at me. Moses could have had no power unless he had defined the yoke. He had to say, this is the yoke. This is the yoke. This is it. The next, Gideon had to say, Midian is the yoke. Midian is the yoke. David had to say, that giant is the yoke. Every generation produces a yoke. How, how many of you are with me on this? Say amen. amen. Now look at me. Every generation 
hell belches out a new weapon. Heaven is never passive. It forges a weapon. I said it forges a weapon. When hell belches out a new weapon, heaven creates a weapon. When hell creates a weapon, heaven creates a weapon. Somebody say amen. amen. But the weapon of heaven is unique to that yoke. Now, if you heard what I'd said, you'd have gotten up and run around this building and slapped somebody. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you again. I said, whenever hell creates a weapon, heaven creates a new weapon. And it forges it, and it is a unique weapon. And that weapon that heaven creates is uniquely designed to neutralize and smash the yoke of bondage. Oh, glory to God. Now, then heaven seeks somebody. Every generation, heaven looks for somebody. Your denomination may have rejected you, but God may be looking for you. Even your mama might think you are stupid, but God may be looking for you. You may be out there, you may be doing nothing, you may be going door to door giving people excuses. You may be feeling useless, like the man that was selling hearing aids over the phone. But God said, go and find me, Gideon. Go and Moses was scared of men. He could only hang around with sheep. He was old, tired, burned out, and heaven went after him. I believe that this week, somebody get ready to shout, please. They're not just going to be young men and young women and housewives and people that come into this house every night. God is going to fall on somebody. He's going to shake them up. He's going to say, I've chosen you and I'm going to give you the power to break a yoke in your generation. I'm going to give it to you. is something for every proud preacher. And I've seen them on TV. Some of them could strut sitting down. They're so arrogant. Some of them, forgive me, some of them have big entourages, just like flies hanging around garbage. I maybe no no somebody needs to talk this way. Are you with me on this? Oh yeah. They get on an issue and they run that issue to the ground. They get on a doctrine, they run it into the ground. Look at me. Let every preacher listen to me. If you are avoiding the yoke you are also avoiding the anointing. I maybe heard what I had to say just then. If you're avoiding the yoke, you're avoiding the anointing. One day I got with the minister and I almost slapped him. I maybe ever lost it. How many of you ever seen these baseball players? They get mad all the time. Well, I'm Latin and German. Imagine that. Yo soy latino y alemán. Tengo los, la sangre de los dos en mi cuerpo. ¿Sí? And, and it's amazing because when I get mad, it's like split personality. If I get really, really mad, the Latin side jumps up and says, kill him, kill him. Yes, that's right. But the German side, it's the emotional, logical, the intellectual, unemotional side. It says, control your emotions and then think of ways to kill him. Well, thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his mercy. One day, I walked in after this word. The Lord said, this is the yoke. 
This is the yoke. You're not going to know the anointing until you understand the yoke. If you haven't defined the yoke, you will never understand the anointing. Because the anointing is not for you, it's for the yoke. The anointing is not to bless you, make you feel better. It's not a hot flash or a cold chill. It's not falling down, it's not laughing. The anointing is for the yoke. 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 Somebody help me with this. The anointing is for the yoke. Let it get into the blood and in the heart of every believer. So we're in one of those ready rooms and I'm with one of those pastors. He looked peeking out at the crowd. Man, these people are not praising God the way they should. They look drowsy and tired. The saints look tired. And he looked at me and he said the wrong thing. He said, brother, we need the anointing to break the yoke over this service. And then, ah! The Evander Holyfield anointing came all over me, see? And as I was about to hit him, I looked at him, I said, brother, the yoke is not for fat, drowsy saints to get in the mood to worship God. That's not what it's for. And don't you waste it anymore on that. Let me look at you for a second. How many of you know the Bible says, raising my hand and giving the fruit of my lips a praise. Whether I feel like it or not, I don't wait for an angel to tickle me. I don't wait to feel good. I raise my hand. And I thank the Lord. I'm not going to use something that God gave me to bust the devil with, liberate a suicidal teenager, and use it to alter my mood in church. The anointing is for the yoke. The anointing is for the yoke. the hearts of all these people. Everybody, how many of you give me a few more minutes? Raise your hand now. Oh. The year of Jubilee was announced by Christ in his life by declaring the yoke that he was anointed to break. I'm going to stop and look at you. Why was Jesus so powerful and unique? I had to know this on that mountain. I had to know when I come off this mountain, I have got to go in the power of the Spirit by divine strategy in accordance with the counsel of God. I got to make the Holy Spirit the PR director of my ministry, the administrator of my ministry. I got to die to all private strategy and embrace the will of God for my life. I want every gospel singer that's listening to me right now to hear me now. We have got a bunch of money making entertainers running around the church. Now look at me. And it's fine. It's fine. It's fine if that's all you want. If you want to get home, count your money with bags under your eyes and wonder how many records you sold. But I want to tell you, and I'm saying this, I've, I've been good friends with Carmen and Gary Oliver, and I want to tell you what sets their voices apart is if you say to God, I don't give a rip what the church thinks of me. I want to have a voice, listen to me, a voice that on the radio and on TV, without changing my lyrics, I will get the world to stop and listen to the sound of God's anointing. <laughs> Who was Jesus? Listen to this. Who was Jesus? Who was Jesus? Heaven sees the evil. Look at me. Heaven sees the evil. And then heaven says, I'm going to make me a weapon. 
and then I'm going to look for somebody touch them with the oil of separation I'm going to separate them I'm going to ruin their plans I'm going to make their highest aspiration look boring to them I'm going to mess up their own self concept I'm going to make them yawn at the thought of everything they ever thought was achievement I'm going to separate them, touch them with the oil of the anointing. And then I'm going to send them to go to that yoke. Now, Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable or the year of God's favor. These are jubilee statements. This is not unlike what they were to read in that year. But look, everybody look at me. What was the secret of Christ's power? God asked me that question. What was the secret when Jesus was incarnate on earth? What was the power that made the demons leave? What was the power that made the dead rise and calm the storm and feed the 5,000? I said it was because he was sinlessly perfect. God said, no, you've not touched it yet. The secret of his power was not that he was sinlessly perfect. He said, no, that was a factor that he had even before he was incarnate. That was not the catalyst. That was not the detonation device. And I said it must have been because Jesus hated sin so desperately and he was the son of God I said he was powerful with miracles because he was the son of God no that wasn't the answer he said don't you understand that I made my son to be human that he would be a model for every preacher that would ever preach the gospel after him that as he was sent others would be sent he was tempted like you were tempted he received the Holy Spirit as you received the Holy Spirit he was called as you were called and he said, what is it? The power of Jesus was he knew why the Holy Spirit was upon him. And began his ministry by describing the yoke and the anointing. He began his ministry by describing the yoke and the anointing. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because they are brokenhearted. Because they are poor people. Because they are oppressed because there are those that need liberty and I'm not sent to you I'm sent to them and because I know what the yoke is I know what the anointing is now everybody get ready to shout right now and the anointing will break the yoke come on somebody it will break the yoke But I got to tell you two more things. Can I tell you two more things, please? Not only is there a yoke and an anointing in every generation, we need a description and a definition of the anointing. The anointing is the separation of an individual to a higher purpose, where God reveals to them the enslaving instrument of their generation and then renders them effective. The word dunamis, everybody said dunamis. The word dunamis in the Bible, the Greek definition of that word, we all say dynamite power. Here is the most core definition of the word dunamis. Rendered effective. God says, I chose you, separated you. I've shown you what the yoke is. I authorize you to go and break it. Now, here's another word for the yoke, policy. Everybody say policy. policy. Today's yoke is not physical, it is electronic. We are yoked by pornography through the internet. We are yoked as a nation through visual images that are as addictive as any chemical ever was. Am I right? They've already proven that TV causes children to commit violence. They've proven it. Now, that's the yoke.
Then here's another word for the yoke. Policy. Somebody said policy. policy. The laws that are written, the styles that are created, the musical lyrics of the generation, the clothes that you must wear or you are not cool, the group you must run with or you are out, the things you must do to stay. And right now, they know this. The tobacco industries know they are making a thing that kills people. They know they are. Why are the kids smoking it? Because there is a yoke of peer pressure on their neck. It says cancer's bad, but being out of the group is even worse. That's a yoke. Let me tell you about Jasper, Texas right now. And Jasper, Texas, there may be some decent folks in that town, but for all of their life, like it or not, hate it or not, that town of Jasper, Texas will be remembered for one evil event. One racist, ugly, evil event. But before they dragged that man to kill him, what did they have?